Okay, thank you, Sandro, for hosting this session. Uh, now I will be the chair of this talk uh, that, uh, that will be given by Professor Said Hamdou from Delft University of Technology. <clears throat> uh, the, the talk is titled uh, Device Aware Test, the mean to win the war against unmodeled faults. But before I pass the floor to Said, um, I will show some words about his, his bio. Uh, Said Hamdou is currently head of the quantum computer engineering department of Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands. He's also co-founder and CEO of Cognitive IC, a startup focusing on hardware dependability solutions. Hamdou received the MSCE and PAG degrees, uh, but uh, with honors from TU Delft. Uh, prior to joining TU Delft as a professor, uh, Said worked for Intel Corporation in the uh, United States, Philips Semiconductor, uh, in France and Philips uh, NXP semiconductors uh, in Netherlands. His research focuses on two domains, emerging technologies and computing paradigms, including memory stores for logic and storage, in-memory computing, neuromorphic computing, low-power hardware architecture uh, for edge uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. Uh, and hardware dependability, including testability, reliability, hardware security. Uh, Hamdou owns uh, two patents. Uh, he has published one book and contributed to other two and had quarter over uh, 250 conference and journal papers. He has consulted for many semiconductor companies in our area of memory testing and Hamdou is a senior member of IEEE. Uh, he was associate editor of many journals as uh, IEEE TVLSI, uh, Journal of Techno uh, Technology Testing. Um, and serves uh, on the digital, bo digital boards of IEEE Design and Test and ACM Journal on Emerging Technologies in Computer System. Said Hamdou is the recipient of many international national awards. For example, he is a recipient of European Design Automation Association Outstanding Dissertation Award from 2001 and many best paper awards uh, in conference like DATE, uh, IS, VLSI, ICCD, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so there's a pleasure to have you giving this talk, Said. Now uh, you have the floor to do your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, if you are in Brazil, probably good, uh, good evening or good morning. It depends on who you are. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this uh, very nice initiative and share with you some of uh, our work, what we are doing in the OFT. And today I will be talking about uh, device hour tests. We will explain to you what does that mean and why we think this will be kind of a revolution in the upcoming years. Um, for those who are interested in my slides, I will be happy to send them to you if you want. Just drop me an email on, the, on my email address you see on the slide and I will be happy to share my slides with you. So how will, I will, I will, uh, I will uh, present my work today. First, I will talk about the challenge. Uh, what's the real problem we are facing and why we, why we need what, we are, what is called device hour test. I will explain to you in a couple of minutes what does that mean. And then we'll take this new concept of testing, new radically new approach of testing, and try to apply it, device hour test, we call it that, try to apply to two industrial chips, STTM RAM and DRAM. When I'm saying industrial, chips which means we did measurements we did characterization and this is not just a theory so it's a theory which is validated on real silicon chips right and finally we'll conclude my talk and show you the superiority of this new approach so let me start so i assume all of you know that the industry is pushing very hard for the commercialization of new emerging memory technologies in your laptop or a smartphone, whatever you have, always the processing units, you have your analog design, but you have also a memory that should store your information. You know the DRAM, the ISRAM, the flash, and so on. This technology is what you could conventional technologies or traditional technologies with scaling, they are suffering from problems. If you think about, for example, ISRAMs, scaling, the voltage and the dimension suffers because you may have more leakage, uh, non reversed uh, cells, and so on. If you think about DRAMs, for instance, you will suffer in realizing what you call the trench capacitor in your silic. And because of these reasons, companies, as those you see on my slide, are heavily investing in new emerging technologies, 
like the IMRAMs, the RIRAMs, and the PCA. And you see big players are investing that. For instance, you can see founders like Global Founders, TSMC, you see leading semiconductor companies like Intel, uh, ST, and so on, IBM as well. So you see there is a huge investment in order to push for the commercialization of new emerging non-volatile members. Nevertheless, before you will sell or ship your chip to the real integration in the in in in, in consumer electronics or whatever application you need to ensure that that your chip performs the right operation for the targeted lifetime of the application you cannot uh, 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 accept selling a bad product or a non-reliable chip to your supplier let's say a system integration so therefore this testing step, which we do after we manufacture our chip, is the last chance for each semiconductor company to guarantee the customer satisfaction in terms of quality, reliability, and so on. Keep in mind that these chips, they consist of billions of transistors, of units. I should be able to guarantee that the way these units or these transistors are connected, it's correct, there is no broken line, there is no missing transistor, there is no uh, extreme variability, and so on. And this should be done, this should be done in milliseconds for each chip. Actually, each chip a company manufactures should be tested. When you are doing your design, you do your design for, uh, uh, for a new chip, for a new design, new memory, for example, you do your verification, whatever, netlist extraction, all of this are done one shot. After you type out your chip and you need to go for the high volume protection, if you're going to manufacture 1 million, you need to test each of these 1 million chips. So it's an extremely expensive process. Test is just money. As of today, this in, for these image memory technologies, we don't have a dedicated test solutions. There are no specialized test solutions. And then you can say, okay, who cares about that? We can use the tra traditional approach. We can use the same methodologies like we used for DRAMs and ESRAMs and so on. Yes, well, let's see what's, gonna, what's, what's going on if we're going to do that. Today, the state of the art of test solutions so far, they have been always assuming that any disease in the chip, any defect in the chip can be modeled as a linear resistor outside the device so we let's say if you have a device which is defect we keep the device ideal not defect and we inject a linear resistor in series or in parallel with our device and we do the simulation and we see what is the what does the what's the way this injected linear resistor which may make the defect what's the way this impacts the electrical behavior of our device and that's how we develop fault models you can clearly see that it's an abstraction of the defect. And because small in technologies, emerging technologies have new fire mechanisms, obviously this linear resistor cannot really model, model them in an appropriate way. What you see today is that companies are even the, using functional tests. So after the manufacturing test, where we use fault models to develop test algorithms, after this manufacturing test step, they deploy another additional step. We do the we do the functional testing, which means they they run the function the function for which the chip is targeted to to check the quality of the chip. And why they are doing that? Because they want to reduce the potential escapes. What is it? An escape, a test escape or a chip escape is the chip that we our test program assume it's a good chip, but in the reality the chip is faulty. So you test your chip, it passes your test program. You put it in the application, it will fail. So we call it an escape. When we do functional testing, which is extremely costly, companies are aiming at compensating for the missing fault coverage and therefore minimize and minimizing the number of test escapes which can end at the customer side. The situation becomes scorched when we consider new device technologies like an STT IMRAM, etc. Because these new technologies they have unique fair mechanisms that we don't fully understand yet. Just give you an example. Assume this is a device 
Yeah, which is a transition. This is HTT MRAM device. So if you're going to deploy the traditional approach, what you will assume would assume that the defect within this device can be mimicked as a linear resistor or a parallel resistor. And the relationship between the voltage and the linear resistance, as you can see, it's constant. If you take a look at the reality, this is measurements we get from our partners, IMEC in Belgium. This is the relationship between the resistance and the voltage of a good device. And this is of a defective device. You clearly see that there is a no, no way to mimic this faulty behavior to create this loop just by injecting a linear resistor in your netlist of your emerging technology circuits. Hence, using a linear resistor is incomplete, is inappropriate to appropriately model the defects in emerging technologies. What we need with an accurate defect modeling, because this will help us to develop appropriate test solution. If we know exactly what is the disease, we understand the disease, we can propose an appropriate and accurate medicines. So we need to cl close the gap between the real defect mechanisms and the way we are modeling the behavior or the, 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 the behavior of the, of, of, of the memory in the presence of such defects. And that's what you call device our test. So which means we are developing a test approach which is aware about how the defect or how the device behaves in the presence of the defect. How we will do that? This defect our test has three steps, and it's exactly how I want to do it. Defect modeling, fault modeling, and test solution. So in the beginning, we would like to analyze the disease and understand how does the disease impact your temperature just to to give an analogy with the human body, your temperature, your heart beats, and so on. Without understanding the defect, it will be hard for us to develop an appropriate model. Once we develop an accurate model, life becomes easy. We can see if this model is realistic for a certain design or not, because you may have some defects applicable for a certain manufacturing line, let's say in, in global foundry, but the manufacturing line at TSMC could be different. So we can see which defects are realistic for which manufacturing line, and by doing that, we can develop realistic fault models and thereafter appropriate test solutions. And we'll go now through these steps one by one. Assuming we have a defect, what should we do for the defect modeling, for fault modeling, and for test generation? The first step of defect, our test is defect modeling. What we do actually, assuming we have a compact model for a device, it could be a transistor, it could be an STTM RAM device, it could be a rerun device. Assume we have a compact model of a defect-free device. And assume on the other side, we have a defective device. Actually, what we'd like to do is to uh, involve or analyze the way the defects impact this compact model and produce another compact model which incorporates the way defe the defect manifests the electrical behavior of the device. So how would you do, do this? First, by doing what you call physical defect modeling. So we take the defect mechanism and we analyze the way it impacts what we call the technology parameters of the device. The technology parameters could be the size, the thickness, uh, the, the length, the width of the device could be any technology parameter. Once we incorporate the way the defect impacts these technology parameters, we create actually what we call effective technology parameters. So these parameters incorporate the way the defect has an impact. Then we go and develop the electrical parameters of the device. In that case, we are talking about a RERAM device, for instance, right? So we take the electrical parameters of the device, SPICE model, for instance, and we now inject the new technology parameters in the electrical equations of our compact model, SPICE model, in order to generate a defective rerun model. And then we do the fitting of the model by using some measurements data that we have about our, our defect. And we can iterate this process till we get a compact model, a SPICE model, that mimics, in this case, a rerun defect chip. And of course, we can check that the defect, the compact mo uh, model really mimics the real uh, uh, measurements we have. 
So this is the first step. Once we have this step, actually, which bridges the electrical model with the physical model, once we have this step, we need to move to the second step, which is fault modeling for memories. And again, the focus on this in this talk is only on memories. What is the way we do fault modeling? The first thing we do, we try to develop an analytical approach in order to define the whole space of fault models. What is the whole space is what can theoretically go wrong in a memory. Yeah? So actually, the memory has the array, the periphery. In this talk, I will talk only mainly about this cell. So if you have a memory, typically you, you perform an operation. And if you perform an operation, a fault may, may be sensitized. So the way we model the operation, we call it the sensitizing operation. So the fault primitive notation you see here is a compact notation that describes the fault at the primitive level. So what's the way we, we model the, 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 the fault? We need a sensitizing operation to sensitize the fault. And this sensitizing operation can be, for instance, a transition write operation, meaning writing one in a cell containing zero. It could be down writing transition. It could be a non-transition write operation, but it could be also read operation. For instance, you read zero from a cell containing zero. Typically, in reality, we are writing words, but to make life easier, we are talking here about just one bit, a cell. So applying, for example, read zero to a cell containing zero, it could be a sensitizing operation. And if it's a sensitizing operation, what happened, we create a fault in the cell. And the cell, the, the, the fault could be that the cell will flip from zero to one. Actually, this should not happen. But unfortunately, before, because of a certain defect in the memory, we will have a memory flipping to one. However, for emergent memory, what we have seen is that, it, that the fault effect can be more than flipping to zero or one. What you see here, for instance, on the right side is the measurements we got or we performed at iMac on STT IMRAM device. So and normally, according to the spec, this STT IMRAM device should have a low ohmic state about around 2 kilo ohms and a high ohmic state about around 5 kilo ohms. This is the green window. This is the correct devices. Whatever you know, uh, blue, uh, bullets you see out outside this green space, it, most, it means that the chip is faulty. So you see clearly, for example, that some devices and have a value of undefined state. Why undefined? Because we have a spec for high ohmic state and low ohmic state. Outside this spec, it's undefined. Also, these guys, for instance, are undefined. But also what you see also here, that some of devices, they had extremely high ohmic state outside the spec. And others, they had extremely low state outside the spec. So it's not only about zero and one, it's also about undefined state, extremely low state, low, low ohmic state, or extremely high ohmic state. These are things which are out the spec, and that is something we measured using real uh, silicon chips. So our F now, traditionally for SRAMs, for instance, is just zero and one. For this imaging memories like STT or RIRAM, we should also consider U and L and H. And of course, the last component of the fault primitive is the read value. Typically, if you apply a read operation, you could get a, a, quick, a correct value at the output or a wrong value. For example, here, you apply a read zero operation. The cell will flip from zero to one, the fault effect. And you're going to get one at the output value, at the read. So your read could be 0 or 1, but could be also undefined. When it's the case undefined, if the, let's say, if you have a sense signifier sensing your, your output, like what we have in the, uh, in the ISRAMs, if the difference between the bit lines at the input of the sense signifier is too small as compared with the spec required for the, uh, the input of the sense signifier, then your sense simplifier can give you a zero or one randomly. Let's say if the difference is zero between the bit lines, so your, 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 your sense simplifier can switch any direction, and therefore it's random. And in case our right or uh, the sensitizing operation is a right, the read is not applicable, so we replace it with a dash. So typically what you see here now, once we're using these fault primitives, we can define the whole space, theoretical space, because it becomes a mathematical equation. I know the S, I know the F, I know the R, I have a notation, 
and I can define the whole space. For instance, I can write, apply write one to a cell containing zero. The cell may remain in zero, which means I have a transition fault, or go to L or U or H. So typically, you can define the whole fault space. Not only by using a single operation, we can have multiple operation, write one, write zero, etc. So we can typically define the whole theoretically possible space. Once we have that, we can say now, let's validate our space. What is realistic for this technology or for this manufacturing chip as compared with the other one? As I told you before, different manufacturing lines could have different uh, uh, realistic fault models. So how we do the validation? Of course, you are very familiar with defect injection sequence simulation. We, we start with a net list and we inject a defect, right? So typically in traditional way, we inject a linear resistor using device aware test. What we do, we go to the net list, we remove the compact model or the, the, the spice model of the, of the device, and we replace it with another compact model, which is based on, on our what we call device aware defect model, what I showed you uh, a couple of minutes ago. Because we developed in the first step a new compact model, which incorporates at the electrical level, the way a defect impacts your electrical behavior. I integrate now, I will replace the good device with this, the compact of the bad device. And then I will, of course, generate my stimuli, which is your sensitizing operation. As I told you, it could be zero, right one, one, right zero, or multiple operations up to you to choose. And then sweep the defect size by changing some parameters of this compact model. And then do the circuit simulation, analyze the force, and then it will check which force, which fault primitives are realistic or not realistic? Because I have the whole space and I can do what's realistic or not realistic rather than testing for everything. So typically, once we do this, we have the false. We can analyze what kind of force we get. We can get easy to detect false or hard to detect false. You see also here, an analyzing false gives you an idea about how much effort you need to do to detect the fault. Will it be an expensive solution? Or an easy solution. If your fault is easy to detect, that typically means that the fault will always cause an error. Let's say you are reading zero, but you get one at the output, right? That's an example. So this gives you a deterministic fault behavior. And therefore, you can always guarantee the detection by applying these reads and writes. Hence, we can use, for instance, March test algorithms or implement these March algorithms using best test engines. What we can also, we can also have what we call hard to detect false. These are false, which can take you to undefined state or give some disturbance in the cell or in, the, in, 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 in your voltage or your currents. Hence, you cannot guarantee always, you, can, you cannot guarantee their detection using just read and write. Here is an example. Let's say you are doing read one to a cell containing one. Your cell will go to undefined state and your sense simplifier or your read output will be random, which is sometimes is zero, sometimes is one. So when you do the test, maybe you will be lucky you get one. So the test will you it will tell you it's a pass, but in reality it's a fail because you, you were just lucky to get this read one instead of getting read zero. This kind of faults require special tests. You maybe you need design for stability. You need some stress combinations. You need to guarantee you need to do something more than reading and writing. Maybe you need to 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 in, in integrate some, some, uh, some design in your memory chip to facilitate the detection of these faults, or maybe provide high voltage, high temperature, whatever, some dedicated so, uh, stresses in order to guarantee the detection. So in conclusion, device our test has three steps. Defect modeling, you take into account the way the defect impact the physics of the device. Then you generate a new compact model that mimics the way the defect impact the fault, the, the, the electrical behavior. And then using netlist and defect injection circuit simulation, you can validate the space and select a subset of the space, which is realistic for your design. And finally, you, de you develop the test solutions either for easy or hard to detect faults. So now what I will do in the rest of this talk, I will show you two cases. We apply device hour test on STTM RAMs and then DRAMs. Actually, we compare device hour test with the state of the art commercial solutions. OK, the first, what I will do, we will apply device test for what we call synthetic anti-ferromagnet flip in STTM RAMs. 
and you can find more uh, information in these two papers, ITC paper and this date paper. And you can see because of the quality of the solution at ITC, the paper was nominated for the best paper award. And even there was distinguished paper. At date, this paper get the best paper award. So you can clearly see the impact of this solution as compared with the state of the art. Let me now show you how what we did. So let me give you some basics first about STT MRAMs. STT MRAMs actually, the driver is what we call magnetic tunnel junction, as you can see here. You see here, the device has actually typically different layers. You see the free layer, and the free layer, it, we can actually switch its magnet, magnetization orientation in the way we want by driving it with an electrical, with a magnetic field through us, through a current or through providing external magnetic field. You have the tunnel barrier and you have the paint layer, which has two layers, the reference layer and the hard layer. These re reference layer and hard layer are supposed to have permanent direction. If it's if the magnetization of this uh, uh, hard layer is oriented to, the, to the, the bottom in that case, it will remain always there. And these two uh, two layers are pointed to the opposite direction. And they compose of uh, uh, the, what the, they form what we call the pin layer. So you cannot change their magnetization, the orientation. You can only change the magnetization of the free layer. And this is what we call synthetic anti ferromagnet of the device. Actually, this SEF, of course, exercises a certain magnetic field on the free layer. That's an intramagnetic field. Typically, some technology parameters of the device, this, this field can be seen as a technology parameter because these layers, these magnetic layers, will exercise an, a field that we will, either we like it or not, it will be always there. We have all the technology parameters, for example, what we call TMR, which is called the technology magnetic resistance. Actually, it, it, it gives you the ratio between uh, the, the, the R on, the low ohmic state, and the off ohmic state of this device, because this device can be in two directions. Huh? It can be in what we call uh, uh, P, uh, parallel state, because you see here, we, we can change the orientation of the and the magnetization of the free layer and make it parallel with the with reference layer. In that case, the device would be in low ohmic state. But we can also change the orientation of this magnetic or free layer, and we will have opposite uh, magnetizations, and then the device would be in high ohmic. And of course, we can always read our device. Very important to know, in addition to the technology parameters, we have electrical parameters, which are very important. What is the RP and REP is the low ohmic and high ohmic state. What is the switching current I need to drive? Because to, to, to make the switching, I need to drive, to drive a current in this cell. What is the minimum switching current in order to switch the device from P to AP or AP to P, parallel to anti-parallel or anti-parallel to, to parallel? And what is the switching time I need? So these are critical electrical parameters that actually decides about spy out spy uh, uh, decide ab about our spice model and of course we can always switch this device by applying a current but also by applying an external magnetic field this is the way we can switch the device so obviously a technology parameter if you have a defect here you can impact the electrical parameter as well so what what i will show you now some measurements we perform with our partners at IMEC, we measured two devices. Good device, and we show you the characteristic of a good device and a bad device. This is what we call the RH loop. What we do, we exercise a magnetic, external magnetic field of the device. We sweep the, the, the field, you see, we sweep the, the field from positive to negative and see how does the switch, the device switch between parallel to anti-parallel. Actually, we are switching the free layer because the, the, the reference layer is fixed. You see clearly for this good device, this is the orientation switching from anti-parallel to parallel and switching from P to AP. We got this direction. So we need a negative field to switch from P to AP. For this, this is for the majority of the device we measured. 
we find some strange devices. You see that this, this, uh, this loop has been horizontally flipped because now I need a positive fill to switch from P to AP. In reality, I need a negative fill. Here I am. I need, I, 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 I need a, a positive fill. So there is strange, quite strange. So this, this uh, uh, HR loop we get is different than what, what we are expecting at the good device. If we go to the electrical characterization, means we drive the current in, or we drive a voltage. In that case, we are driving a voltage. We are sweeping a voltage across the device, a good device and a bad device. And you see the device will switch from P to EP and then back from EP to P. You see there is no difference at all. It looks the device is good, fantastic. But still, we cannot deny the fact that we have a problem. And the question is how to explain the problem. Coming back to the fundamental physics of the device, you see that the only thing we can switch is the free layer, right? And if free layer is, uh, is indicating a different orientation, the reference layer, then we are in a high ohmic state or anti-parallel. If they are in the same direction, then they are parallel. So actually what happened in order to get to this switching, you need to have the reference layer and the hard layer flipped. Initially in a good device reference layer providing the magnetization orientation to the top or the north in that case, and here it's switched to the bottom. And of course, if the reference layer is switched, the hard layer will switch as well. So you see the orientation of hard layer and reference layer are switched as compared with the good device. And that's exactly why we need in that case, for, for example, here, you see that the intra, the again, as you remember, the, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, this pin layer exercise some field here uh, on the free layer. Here it was shifting to negative and here is shifting to the positive. You see, that is consistent. And again, here I need uh, for a defective device, I need a positive field to switch from P to EP, from P to EP to make it this, the, the, the different orientation. So that is exactly what he, this explains. So in conclusion, we have a, a flip, a defect, and we call it synthetic anti-ferromagnet flip, S-A-F-F defect. Now we have a defect. So let's see, do we need to care about this device, the defect or not? To do that, we start first with our traditional approach. Traditional approach tells you you don't much care, you don't need to care much about the device, the defect in the device. You can model the defect as a linear resistor in series or in parallel. That's exactly what we did. And we, we had a three by three simulation platform. We actually take also the background of the neighbors into considerations. We did all the different flavors, all zeros, zero, zero, ones, till all one, one, ones. We went through the same simulation approach. The only difference now in defect injection, we are injecting a linear resistor one time in series, one time in parallel. And of course, we are sweeping the, resist, the, the, the value of the resistance from uh, low value to extremely high value to see what can happen, okay? And we did the simulation. We validated, you see the linear resistance here and in parallel, different value of the resistance. We validated which kind of fault primitives can be realistic or not realistic. And then we optimized them. This is the real fault space. We develop a detection condition to develop a test algorithm. And finally, we develop a test algorithm. So following the traditional approach, we did fault, fault analysis. We derived fault, fault, fault primitives. And then we developed a test algorithm, which will guarantee the detection of the defect according to this methodology. And this is a test algorithm. Just initialize the memory to zero, write zero, read one, and then in the opposite uh, down uh, addressing, we write zero, read zero. That's according to the commercial solution, what we should do. Fine. Now let's go to our device. What we did at IMIC, we took this up, the, the test algorithm and we applied it on the defect device and see what's going to happen. First, we applied to the good device. Remember, this is the electrical characteristic of the good device. So what we did, we applied the, the write zero operation. That's exactly the write zero. The C will go to zero. Then you apply write one. Of course, we apply write one. This will pass correctly. And then we read one, the, the device in high ohmic state in the, is the one state. So we will read one, right? 
And then we write zero again, we write zero again, and I read zero, I will read zero correctly. No problem. The, the, the test will pass. And that's exactly what you expect from a good device. If we go now to a bad device, our bad device had the same thing here, right? The same characteristic. So what will happen now, your test will give you also a good values. So the traditional approach will tell you, yes, your, def your defective device is good, is healthy. And this will end in an escape means you will sell a bad chip to your customer. Now, the question is, what should you do with it? Let's go and see what happened if the, uh, if the device I will approach is able to catch this device or not. OK, remember, the first step of device aware test was device aware defect modeling. Remember, if this defect is divisive defect, this free layer undergoes uh, undergoes actually a, a coupling effect from the from the pin layer. We call it intra fill, but also coupling from the neighbors. I'm showing here only one neighbor here, so we call it intercoupling. So you have intra coupling and intercoupling, and in the reality, you have eight neighbors, so you will have eight coupling effects. And it's very important to model what is the impact of this coupling in the presence not only of the intercoupling, but also intracoupling, magnetic coupling. So uh, the details can, can be found in our ITC paper. We, do, we use this theory uh, to model actually the field in each point. And then we, we uh, model actually also using what you call bound current theory, the, the magnetic moment at each point of this point. It's quite complex theory, but again, you can find details in these two references, but also in our paper. And then what we did, we calculated the total impact of the coupling on the, on the magnetization of the free layer. And we did some simulation, right? We did some simulation of the good devices using different uh, electrical diameter of the of the device. You see, we have 20 nano, 30, 35, and 55 nano. So we call it uh, electrical critical dimension, which actually used to describe the MTG device of HTML device as a, it's a common practice. So what you see here, you see the the impact of the magnetization, the smaller, the smaller the diameter, uh, the ECD, the diameter, the larger the impact. And you see the worst case impact is in the case where all the neighbors are one, all the EPs are two, so the, the neighbors are one, 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 meaning two, five, five. So you see the electrical field here, the, the magnetic field goes up to two, 200 in absolute, in absolute numbers, and it goes to up uh, from minus, mi minus 500 to uh, minus 200 uh, uh, fourth state. That's actually what we use to, to as a unit for the field. So, and if you go for a, 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 a this is for the good device, and if you do it for the bad device, what you see now, so this is our compact model, you see in the presence of the defect, this field, it's now instead of being negative, it's positive. And what you see actually is the field in absolute number is going up. It's more than 600. So quite remarkable. So the, the, the total coupling, magnetic coupling on the victim cell, on the defective cell is becoming larger and the orientation is becoming positive. Now, and again, the worst case is in the case all the neighbors are one one. That's our model now. We have a compact model. The next now, what we do, we inject. Of course, we we, we use this model to uh, analyze the impact on the electrical parameters because we need to see how does the defect, the coupling, impact the electrical parameters of the device. And in that case, is the current and the switching time. We did also some fitting. We used some data measurements to do the fitting for the safety of time. I will just go quickly. Here you see actually the solid line gives you our model. Huh? It, it gives you the, the switching time as compared with the voltage pills you provide for the device. The, the green bullets, it gives the measurements. You see clearly that our compact uh, model fits perfectly with the measurements. So now we have the compact model. We can do the fault, uh, defect injection, circuit simulation, and analyze the space of faults. What we did, we did the analysis for two kinds of defects, two kinds of designs, 200 millimeter pitch, so which means we have cells which are a little bit relatively far away. We did not observe any fault, not for single cell, not for coupling cell, 
No, so the impact of the coupling is negligible. And then what we did, we did the same thing for another design for which the pitch is 52.5 uh, nanometer, which means now these cells are adjacent close to each other relatively. We did the analysis for single cell holes. Again, remember we have the whole space. You see here, actually we did not observe any single cell, no coupling faults. We, we assume only the coupling between two cells. If we now assume the coupling between different cells, the neighborhood, what you see, we saw this, this following thing. If you actually apply zero right one operation, the distribution, you see, this is the writing time. This is the spec. As last your writing time is below the spec, a little bit, uh, let's say 21 or whatever nanoseconds, you are okay. You see that the the blue is the defect, the distribution, of, no, the, bl the blue is the distribution of the good device. And the uh, the bronze or the orange is the distribution of the defective of, of the defective device. You see that this coupling speeds up the right one operation, transition right one operation. So it's good for the device. So it makes our operation faster. If now we go to the other opposite, wrong right zero operation, this is again the blue is the good and the orange is defective, guys. You see that sometimes the right zero operation fails. Because we did about 10K Monte Carlo simulation, the accuracy probability of this fault was about 11%. So 11% of the cases, the right zero operation was failing, making a, a down transition in the cell was failing. And this has been observed for the worst case in neighboring, which means all the neighboring cell was, all of them was one, which means one, 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 one. You do a, a, a transition right zero operation, the operation will fail. Sometimes we'll fail, sometimes not. And this, this is why we call it intermittent. And again, now we see there is an, indeed a serious problem in the device and in the memory. So no way you can catch this with your transitional approach. If now we put things in perspective, using device hour test, you're going to get this transition because this fault, we call it neighborhood pattern sensitive operation, intermittent, intermittent passive neighborhood pattern sensitive fault related to right zero operation. If we compare now our approach, device our approach and the conventional approach, actually the fault models, they are everybody, uh, each approach tells us are disjoint, completely different. So if you're gonna use this approach, actually what you are doing, you are since you are actually targeting wrong fault models. You are telling me that there are fault models which are not realistic. Actually, your test algorithm for this will be a solution for non existing problem. If you really want to target the real fault, you need to think about this realistic fault and therefore develop a dedicated test approach. And this helps us to develop the test algorithm because we know that this guy happened from time to time. So we can apply a functional match test. You see here the algorithm because sometimes the fault is intermittent. Sometimes it shows up, sometimes not. I, I need to apply the operation multiple times to increase the probability of the detection. This is the probability of detection of the, of the fault using this match algorithm. If you're going to uh, get 99.99% of, of the probability of detection, you need to use to repeat the match algorithm 19 times. So the more you repeat, the more costly it is. But we can do something remarkable, actually, which is a new concept in the test world. We can apply an external magnetic field on the device. If you apply this you, without driving the cell with a, the, without a current, you can guarantee the detection. Why? Because when we apply a magnetic field externally, what we do will switch the reference layer and the hard layer. And by switching this layer, we can guarantee if we're going to know normally we should read zero. For your good device, you will read zero. But for the faulty device, you will read one. So what you do actually, you do partially uh, reading using by sensing the current in your device, but the writing you do it through an external field. And by doing that, we are guaranteeing the detection of the fault. Again, I will stress the fact that understanding the fault using device hour testing gives you a better understanding which fault are easy to detect using March test and what and, and which one are not. For example, this intermittent fault is hard to detect using only match test algorithms. And therefore, we need innovation. We need something beyond that. And this magnetic test algorithm is an example showing that. So clearly, you see here, using only match test algorithm, 
will never catch your, uh, your, your defective, cell, defective cell, and therefore you need something more. And again, this shows the superiority of device our test. I have five minutes, so it will be very quick in the last part. We did the same thing for reruns, another technology. And again, you see that uh, you can find more details in this European test symposium paper, which also gets the best paper award, and in this journal. Again, this shows the appreciation of the test community for this kind of approach. So how does RIRAM actually technology work? RIRAM, you can, this is a cartoon. Actually, you have the, the, the bottom electrode, the top electrode, and we have a filament. Usually, we have a capping layer. So what we do, when we, when, when, when we manufacture the device, we apply a high voltage in the top electrode in order to create the filament. And this filament actually is the one who will help us to switch the resistance value of the device between high ohmic and low ohmic, depending on the gap between this filament. This is a conducting uh, filament. Uh, and if the gap is high, then we are talking about high ohmic state. And if the gap is smaller, we are talking about low ohmic state. OK, so you see, etc. And I usually we have this capping layer, which makes the switching of the device quickly. And of course, we can talk about technology parameters like the, the height of this filament, the, the, the diameter of the filament, the gap. These are all technology parameters. And of course, we can talk about electrical parameters as well, which is, in, uh, for instance, how much voltage I need to switch the device to set or to reset. Uh, and set means actually uh, bringing the, uh, the device from high ohmic state to low ohmic state. Reset means applying the opposite of, uh, the, op uh, the voltage in opposite direction and bringing the device from low ohmic state to high ohmic state. So the V set and the V reset are electric parameters. And the time in switching time is also from low ohmic to high ohmic or from high ohmic to low ohmic is another electrical parameter. And the ratio between high ohmic state and low ohmic state is another electrical parameter. So this is actually what we model at the electrical level. But if we have any defect, we should just see how the defect impacts the, the dimensions of the device and thereafter incorporate them in the way that the device behaves at the electrical level. So you see, this is actually uh, a, hysteresis, a hysteresis of this RIRAM device that actually this is a real measurement we get from, from uh, uh, one of our partners. It shows the voltage versus the current and you see the V set and the V reset. So um, at one of our partners, we did these measurements on that they did and they shared with us on ST, on reRAMs. The, this is ST microelectronics actually a technology. It's a babular switching, and we did about 936 reset sets for our devices. And the devices have a sit and spec in terms of low ohmic, high ohmic, and the set voltage. What we have been observing actually, we saw so the blue history. This shows you the good device. The orange one, the bad device you see that the low ohmic state is outside the spec. Yeah, it's actually what we call undefined state. It's outside, it's between high ohmic and low ohmic, but outside the spec. So it's a defect, it's a problem because they are defect. We saw also some low ohmic state still within the spec, almost outside the spec. So you see these, the blue is the, the good ones, and this, uh, the, 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 the bronze, it shows actually the golden color shows you the the bad device it, again it's still within the spec but your set is actually your low ohmic state is disturbed and also remarkable enough we saw that this this undefined state does not is not permanent it happens sometimes about one percent of the cases happen and it can sustain three cycles with the set three set set three set set, three set it can still sustain up to three cycles so it's either one cycle two cycle or three cycles so again, we call this intermittent undefined state fault. And again, we did the same. We, we, we need to apply device aware test. We need defect modeling. Actually, the details can be found in our European test symposium. We, we understood the technology. We did the modeling. We used a model actually from Aachen, and we tuned the model to create our appropriate model. And we uh, we calibrated the model. You see he, here actually the blue color is actually the measurement data, and the red is our model. You can clearly see that our model. It's very good, uh, mimics the reality. And even though for a defective device, you see that our model also mimics the bad device. You see the red, uh, here in, in this case, the blue is the defective device, the, the measurements, and the red is our model. Clearly, the, the low ohmic state is perfect model by our model. And then what we did with our compact model, we actually did uh, the, the, the fault analysis uh, the defect injection fault analysis using our model, and we 
found what is realistic and what is not realistic. Clearly, you see here, for example, using this is actually the, the, the parameter you, we used in our model to, uh, uh, to do the simulation for different strengths of the defect. So we found either we may have weak defects or no defects at all, or maybe undefined state. You have a state which shows up and goes, shows up and goes, but it's undefined. It's uh, uh, above the spec. So if you're going to do a read operation, you may get the correct value and you may, get, you may not get the correct value. So this helped us to develop this algorithm. Before talking about this algorithm, I want to show the comparison between device hour test and the commercial traditional approach. So your commercial test approach would again model the defect as a parallel resistor or a linear uh, a serial resistor. This is the fault we get depending on the values of the defect. And this is what we get for uh, using our defect device hour test. Again, you see completely different space of fault models. Which means actually, if you cannot do this, you, you would, uh, if you will apply traditional approach, you would end in test escapes because you will, add, you would develop test solutions for fault models, which does not mimic the reality. The reality is what we have with our device, our test, and this will help you to develop optimized tests and reduce your escapes. How are we going to test for that, for example? Again, this is intermittent. You can have a probabilistic match algorithm, again, because it's, it has a certain occurrence probability. You can only detect this defect probabilistically. Uh, you can do some calculation. For example, if we're going to go for 99% uh, detection probability, we need to uh, repeat the algorithm more than 1,200 times. It's just un unrealistic, right? So which means we can do something more. We can think about using DFT, for instance. In our sense simplified, for example, we can change the reference for high omic and low omic during the test mode yeah we configure that and if we do that we can reduce how much time we need to apply this algorithm for example from 1200 we reduced it by, by 50 percent but we can do better if we can think about more stress combinations and things like that and that's something that we are working on in the department as well so in conclusion immersion technologies comes with unknown nouns we know that there are new defect mechanisms but we don't understand them that traditional approach cannot model them. So we need to do more. The conventional test approach clearly is not good qualified to give us low, uh, low uh, uh, escapes or high quality. It cannot give us high pro outgoing product quality. It actually, it gives us a raw result in order in modeling defects. I showed also that device hour test has a superiority. It can reduce the number of escapes. And it can reduce also your test time by by providing better fault modeling, better test solution. We can increase the defect coverage. Obviously, device hour, uh, device hour test has more, you know, good aspects. Reputation: a company can have a better reputation by reducing the number of escapes. Cost reduction because we have optimized test solutions. But also, we can speed up time to volume and time to to market by doing fast diagnosis and fast year learning. Our approach can give us a, a unique signature for each defect. And by doing that, during the manufacturing or the first samples, you can really better understand what can what is going wrong in your manufacturing line and fix it. Fast diagnosis and fast learning. And of course, this approach cannot be only limited to reruns or PCM, but we can also apply it to ESRAMs, even though to logic. It's a generic approach that can be appli applied to anything. And I think the case studies I showed for ESTM RAM and DRAM clearly show the spirit of this approach and actually this approach it's it's patented we are working on it in, in also in in one of our companies startups in in Delft and, and things are going very good and actually even though uh, uh, we are applied only to rams and ECTM RAM though as I already mentioned the approach is genetic and can be applied to any other technology especially we are when, when we are talking about technology nodes below seven nanometer technologies things are becoming complexer uh, digital becomes more analog, and therefore we think that this uh, solution could have a strong potential. With this, I would like to thank you, and I would be happy to take some of your questions. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I would be happy to take some questions if there is any. Uh, okay, now I now in, in the in the live transmission now. So thank you, Professor Said, for your very interesting talk. Um, first, let me check if we have some questions from the YouTube chat. Uh, we have not 
questions yet, but uh, I, I have some questions to start. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the messages that we, you, you gave us is that um, the device aware test starts with uh, uh, the de uh, device aware defect modeling, right? So uh, to, to do a, a, an accurate modeling of defects, I suppose uh, you have to, to perform uh, a characterization of several uh, chips and several de devices and so on. Uh, I also suppose that it's not difficult to find defective devices in such uh, emerging technologies. But my question is, how difficult is to to measure and to characterize and to, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, characterizing equipment, measure, measurements uh, that we, you, you need to perform to, to do a, 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 an accurate characterization of such defects? Yeah, very good question, Tiago. So, Defect our modeling is a critical component here, right? So companies who are manufacturing these devices, really, I'm going to whatever, of course, be before going to high volume production, they spend a lot of time on characterization, diagnosis, yield learning, etc. Companies have enough equipment. They showed you some data we get from our partners. They have enough equipment. The equipment is it's not a problem. The problem is how to understand this data and make use of it. And because defects will repeat, you will have one defect, you, you model it, you create kind of a library, the model for defect one, model for defect two, number for defect three, and then you have a certain library. <laughs> and as you can imagine, the, the, the defect which should be manufactured by another company, there will be, there's a huge probability that some defects will be also seen there. Like what we see with our CMOS, it's the same thing. You will have a broken line, a missing fire, it's the same thing. So it's, a, it's, a, it's one time investment in the beginning, it needs deep understanding of physics, of engineering, and so on to build a, a, a calibrated. You, you need also the data to calibrate it. If you don't know, if you don't want to calibrate it, you can sweep a certain parameters to, to, to ensure that you are still covering the whole spec. But once you have that, the rest is fully automated. And again, this is a work that you can repeat for each defect. And at certain time, you leave the you 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 will build a huge library which has all what you need, and a company X. I would tell me I have defect ABC. I would tell me, okay, let me give me your data, which defect do you have, and I can run my fully automated test generation or DFT generation, and I would tell you what is the best test approach to use for your data and what is best DFT, rather than using what they call just try whatever. Because most of the companies, what they are doing, I, uh, at least some companies, to be politically correct, some companies, what they are using, put in all the test algorithms they know and train whatever, without deeply understanding what's going on. And how we can op optimize the test program and the way it is you the optimize the test program through getting high volume uh, data and trying to optimize the test program without you know impacting the fault coverage so this this is very costly and at the same time you cannot guarantee that you are really catching some defective chip for which we have unique fault models okay thank you professor said uh, and uh, going further in, in the, the the chain uh, from the device modeling to the the test application um, uh, you have to to develop the test sequence so um, uh, if i understood well uh, the the you, the, these defects allow you to um, uh, generate uh, an accurate test sequence that will be different from that uh, of the, uh, uh, let's say, older technologies or, or, or established technologies. But uh, my question is, um, uh, I, I suppose that these uh, new tests uh, sometimes uh, have to to um, to be applied uh, with uh, higher test sequence with more read and writes and so on. And my question is, uh, how is the impact on the test time or in the uh, test equipment side? If if you need to 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 have a, a different test equipment or if you have to 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 consider it a, a higher test time in the, the test application for this new kind of defects. Yeah. Very good question because I, I, at the end of the day, test time is money, right? Yes. So as we already mentioned before, this device hour test, after the fault analysis, gives you a feeling about what are the faults which are easy to detect and which are the faults which are hard to detect. Easy to detect is quite simple, cheap. Hard to detect, if you can apply the traditional match algorithms, they will be very, very expensive. I showed an example for this STT Imram. When they show the new concept by applying external magnetic field, you do what in one shot. So you have to go beyond traditional way of thinking, just read and write. 
you have to, to maybe use unique features of this technology and mm -hmm. develop develop new test uh, uh, schemes or solutions. It could be designed for stability where you integrate a piece of hardware in your chip to facilitate and speed up the testing. It could be a new way of testing, as I mentioned before, magnetic testing. We apply just a magnetic field and we read. So indeed, this device our test will give you, will enable you to think beyond and up, develop up optimized test solution and still guarantee the detection of these defects. Because if you can optimize your test program, chip test program, but you don't catch the defective chip, you will have a problem with your customer. So it's it's an important dilemma. And again, this device, I want to helps you to understand where you need to spend and for which fault you need additional staff. You need to think out of the box and develop appropriate solution. And there is still an open question in which we are also working in the department as well. Uh, uh, hello, are you hearing me? I have yeah, some I inst instability in my network. Okay, I, I, I lost the, the last part of your answer, but uh, uh, I understand the, 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 the first part and let, let me move for my, my uh, last question. Um, uh, you are focusing on very new uh, device and very uh, novel uh, devices. And uh, if you, we, we take a step back and talk about, for example, a well-established well -established new technology that is FinFET, uh, do we need uh, to still find a new kind of defects and new uh, defect modeling techniques for FinFET technology? Yeah. So uh, as you know, FinFET is a commercial product. So companies have, yes. uh, they are already going to do a job to, to guarantee high product quality. But my assumption is once we move below I don't know, 10, 7, which, which is coming now, the situation may become complexer, which means we may have some fair mechanisms for which our device, our cell aware test or what, or, or, or stick at fault test or delay test will not be able to catch the faults. So you may need something more. And actually the fact that companies are also, at least some of the companies are also using functional tests after the manufacturing test is a clear indication that the models we are using do not fully cover the real defect mechanism of the whole space of the real defect mechanism. Because if this is if this was the case, we would not need to spend money on functional testing. And because we are doing this, as far as I know, it's for some companies, then it means we have a gap to fill in. And I think for, especially for these extremely small technologies, this device our to, uh, device our test could be a good help in improving outgoing product quality even though for fin fat and other technologies okay uh, so thank you so much professor said hamju for your brilliant talk um now uh, i i uh, give the floor to uh, professor sandra to to close the session of this uh, circuit assistance society uh Grande do Sul chapter talk so thank you again said my pleasure You are mute, Sandro. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor, Professor Said. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for this uh, nice talk. Uh, do you want to do some final remarks? I would just like to thank you for uh, inviting me, and I hope uh, uh, people online enjoyed it. And again, if somebody wants more or has interest in my slide, I would be happy to share with them. And I hope if you have any other questions, just drop me an email. You can see my email on the screen. I will be happy to share you the slides and also give you answers. And once again, thank you very much. And I wish everyone a nice weekend. Our weekend already started here, but probably you have to stay to work a couple of hours there in Brazil. Thank you very much. OK, with that, we end the talk today now. Uh, see you. Yeah, thank you very much. All the